thinking this week about what people think of when they think of eternal life. And um, I remember when I was a kid, when we got the newspaper, y'all remember the newspaper? Um, some of us used to deliver those on our bicycles, right, Tarzan? Yeah, we... Um, <laughs> There was a comic, uh, Frank and Ernest, I think it was a little one, one panel one, and every once in a while Frank and Ernest would be sitting on a cloud, like with angel wings, and they were just making some quip. Like that's, that's eternal life, just sitting on a cloud, a couple of wings, making a joke with your buddy. You know, just frankly, like I heard somebody once say that People talk about wanting eternal life and they don't even know what to do with a free Saturday. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> so they end up describing something that just doesn't capture the imagination at all. Or when we picture it, it's like um, maybe an extended vacation um, or maybe like um, if you live in South Dakota and you come to Houston <laughs> for the winter, <laughs> or like Dayton last week said, well, I'll see you in a few months. I'm off to Montana. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Lucky you. I bet it won't be 103 in Montana, right? That's, that'll be eternity, right? Montana in the summer. Beautiful views, and we'll just never get tired of them. Um, and it just seems that there's kind of a lack of imagination to that. And um, I think the final chapters of Revelation um, can lend some truth to our imaginations. Imagination is not bad. It just needs to be, have some truth as its foundation. And um, last week we started Revelation 21. We made it about halfway. And um, Jesus is making all things new. In Revelation 21, uh, we came to the end of that 1,000 years, and Satan was released. There was this big fight. Satan lost. Spoiler alert, Satan loses. Um, and then all things new starts happening. New heaven, new earth. Um, but what's going to happen? We saw a glimpse of this last week. When God makes everything new, um, what, comes, what comes to your mind when you think about that um, I think makes all the difference. Uh, when you talk about having sort of an eternal perspective, nobody wants to be bored by that, right? Um, and when Revelation, one of the things we've seen over and over again is when you get to Revelation, you start having this coming together of, of earth and heaven and then time starts getting weird because John one moment is on earth and then the next thing he's in heaven and then he'll say something and after that and then he's somewhere else and then he'll tell about something and then three chapters later he'll say, oh let, yeah, let me go back to what I was talking about back there and describe that in more detail. And so if you're trying to put a timeline together, it's just really hard work because time just doesn't seem to work like normal time in Revelation. And and place doesn't work like normal place. It's like, John, just sit still for a minute, please. Um, but when God makes all things new when, in, in chapter 21, um, he starts bringing all of this together. Um, this bring together of heaven and earth and time and how that all works. And um, there's a different kind of new that we're going to see. Um, I have this on one of my quizzes in my worldview class that I teach. Um, I have a true-false question that goes like this. True or false, the Bible gives us exhaustive knowledge of God. <laughs> yeah, that word exhaustive is the key to make that false. Uh, the Bible tells us what we need to know about God, all we need to know about God to get us through this life and to know him and have a relationship with God. But it does not tell us everything about God. The book simply isn't big enough, and our brains couldn't handle it anyway. You should be encouraged by that. 
um, especially when you think about eternity. Um, and I think that's true of Revelation 21 and 22 and of the Bible itself. I don't think the Bible gives us exhaustive information about eternity, but it gives us enough truth that we should be thrilled by what we read and our imagination should be able to soar when we start thinking about the truth of a new heaven and a new earth. So the, the, the first part of Revelation was just the word new over and over and over again. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It's easier to imagine a new heaven, or excuse me, a new earth and a new heaven. I don't know what new heaven looks like, but yeah. And, and one of the things we saw over and over last week was that new comes from outside the system. Like we don't work real hard down here to make it all new. Um, God brings all that in from the outside. And um, that's a great thing to remember. And he talks about in there, uh, in the new heaven and, and the new earth, this new city that we're going to talk about today. But he talks about all the things that will be um, no more. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Their death will be no more, neither mourning nor crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So imagine if Joey gets to lead us in restoration in the new Jerusalem. We'll go, oh, it's fully true now right? So take your guitar, Joe. You never know. Um, all the worship leaders take turns. Um, um, so this morning, the second half of Revelation 21, it's a new city. Um, it's an enormous city. And um, I just want to issue a disclaimer. If the future being an enormous city just really, really disappoints you, like you've been to New York City, and you went, really? Forever in that? Like I have to worry about going out at night? S subways? and Okay, no. But I will say this. Next week, it's going to be like the biggest garden you've ever seen. So for those of you who aren't thrilled by the city, come back next week, and it's like outdoors. Um, but today, it's a city. And I want to look at two connections in this city and then who Jesus will be in that city. And I want us to see the two connections. The two connections are between heaven and earth and then the connections between the past, the present, and the future, and then who Jesus will be in that city. Um, and I'm going to try my best not to get stuck on the first point because there's three more after that. But man, this first one. Because we got communion too. We can't be here all day. But... Um, in this New Jerusalem, I want you to see, well, tell you what, let's do this. It's a lot of verses, so I'm going to read them in the New Living because sometimes a big passage is easier um, in a, a translation like this. And, and I want to stop and say just a couple of things before we jump into this. So let me rewind, hit the rewind button. Um, and let's just, let's just tell our story. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues. So here's a, a guy we know from a few chapters ago. I don't know if John's like, hey, I know that guy. That's that angel that poured out that bowl in wrath and went everywhere. So angels get double duty. This one gets to do something good other than bowl of wrath. But um, he comes down and it says, and he came and said to me, come with me. Um, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So he took me in spirit to a great high mountain. I don't know how an angel takes you in spirit anywhere, just go with it, right? To a great high mountain. This is very familiar with Ezekiel. The original hearers of this would have gone, yeah, we know where this is going. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, we saw this last week, so we're going back and getting more detail. Only John gets to go to a great high mountain and see this from this angle. And you'll know why in just a moment. So this holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, it was filled with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious gem, crystal clear like jasper. Its walls were broad and high, with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. And when he measured it, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. 
Okay, now we're, we're measuring a city. Okay, you got this? Get ready. When he measured it, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, it was in the form of a, a cube for its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. That's big for those of you who just joined in. Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick. The angel used a standard human measure. The wall was made of jasper. The city was pure gold, as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 gems. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. Whatever those are, I can't pronounce them, but man, yeah. The 12 gates were made of pearls. I know what that is. You've never seen a pearl this big. Each gate from a single pearl. And the main street was pure gold as clear as glass. Now, I've just kind of stopped there. So we have this city. It east, it's, it's 1,400 miles. That's, give or take a little bit, that's here to San Diego. Are you with me? So this city covers west of the Mississippi. It's got to hold a lot of people, okay? And so it's either shaped like a cube, which would be strange, especially if it were like a giant skyscraper, because you can't imagine that being pretty. But it would be pretty, because look. Um, or maybe like a pyramid, better yet a mountain with a city on it, because I think there's, um, if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, um, I believe it's the horse and his boy. They go to a city. Um, somebody help me with the name of the people who live in the city that's on a mountain. And I love reading the description because this city just always captures my imagination because it's a city on a mountain and there's roads that go up the mountain this way and then there's roads that go up the mountain this way and they all intersect and the houses all have these gardens and it just sounds so beautiful. And so maybe that's what it is. I don't know. We'll see it and we'll go, that's it. And, but it's coming down and it's huge, right? And it's got this wall, 216 feet thick. Now, let's stop for a moment um, and imagine 2,000 years ago and you're sitting in church one Sunday morning and somebody stands up and says, hey, we're going to, John wrote a letter, we're going to finish reading it today. And you hear this, and you're living under Roman rule, and you could, like, your emperor is inventing new ways to torture Christians. And you're faced with the temptation to compromise on a regular basis or die. Um, and Rome is it. Rome is the power. And you're told... Yeah, but there's a city with foundations and a 216 feet thick wall. <sighs> Suddenly you're, you're hopeful and you're encouraged because that sounds strong and fortified and permanent and God made it, right? So Rome isn't going to win. And then no temple could be seen in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city. And the Lamb is its light. The nations of the earth will walk in its light and the rulers of the world will, bring, will come and bring their glory to it. Its gates will never close at the end of the day because there is no night. All the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. No one who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, Let's just make the two connections in this city, this new Jerusalem. The connection between heaven and earth, um, the new Jerusalem, the holy city, comes down out of heaven. So there's this, and it's enormous, remember? It's like west of the Mississippi, big. So the lines are between space and sky and where God lives. Like, where is this coming from? Right? Like, how far did this thing have to travel? How much did they lose of it on the way? We're like pieces falling off the edges, right? 
Like, did God have to put it on the calendar and figure out what time do we have to leave in order to get there? Right? Because this is big. Will it go by the Hubble telescope? Will scientists say there's a ginormous asteroid coming? But here's the amazing thing. And I could have talked about this at any point in Revelation, but today seemed appropriate. In both Greek and Hebrew languages, um, there is one word for sky, heavens, and heaven. In, in Greek, it's uranos, right? So one word does triple duty. Triple duty as either this atmosphere above us, as the expanse of the universe, where we see the night sky, I guess, and then as the dwelling place of God. So the word could mean something visible or something invisible, but all of it real. And the context tells you which usage the author is using, right? So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he put sun, stars, birds, right? So there's heavens far away, there's heavens near. And so Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Maybe he's looking at clouds, maybe he's looking at birds, maybe he's looking at stars, maybe both. But there's always this tension, we talked about this last week, um, that God doesn't fit in the first two, so he needs a third heaven. But in Greek and Hebrew, it's the same word. It's all the same word, right? So when the temple's dedicated, Solomon's like, well, God can't dwell on earth. Heaven, listen to this, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house I've built, yet you will regard the prayers that we pray here. How does that work? This heavens doesn't, don't contain you. Those far heavens don't contain you. And yet you're going to come here and listen to us pray, right? There's this spatial thing, this interconnection between heaven, heavens, and heaven, and earth, so that, like, you don't go to outer space and go a bazillion miles and get to God's house, right? <laughs> By having three words in English, we make it more clear, but we lose just a little bit of the magic out of it, I guess. Like, we get precision, but this is what I think is amazing, is that heaven, where God dwells, could just be right there between heaven and heavens. Right? Because we have, what have we seen in Revelation? There was a door open to heaven. Right? I'm not trying to be like Marvel, Doctor Strange stuff, right? Oof, portal opens, multiverse... I don't know how the angels did it, but a door opened, different realm, right? And I don't know how big the hole has to be for the new Jerusalem to come down. It's going to be a big hole. Um, but I'm like, maybe it's early morning and you're just barely woke up and you go out to let the dog out. Anybody with me so far? Ugh, the dog needs to go out. The birds are singing, you're barely awake, but listen. Right there where those birds are singing, right there could be God's dwelling. Just right behind that bird. Right? Just. Or you look up at the evening sky in the summertime. I love those big, puffy clouds that form in the summer. Right? I was sitting at my desk this week just staring out at one of those ginormous white clouds, and there was this little dot this bird was all the way, way, had to have been an eagle or something. You just barely see this dot up there cruising around in those clouds. And I'm just staring and I'm watching and I'm, I just finished reading this passage and I just thought, you know, a door could open any minute. <laughs> Kelly's in the kitchen just watching me, I guess. And I'm just staring at this bird. And I'm just thinking, heavens, heaven could be right there. Like an angel just like... Psh- <laughs> she's like all of a sudden I hear this voice what are you looking at <laughs> it's like there's this bird you know I just I just sound like myself I guess but and I'm just explaining to her well there's three words in English and one word in Greek and she's just like <sighs> anyway <laughs> uh, 
If we were just given eyes to see, we might see myriads of myriads of angels singing in a city that Jesus is preparing preparing for us, and it might be right there, right? If the heavens were open and we could see what's happening, right? And if heaven is really that close, maybe the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God is that close, and when we pray, your kingdom come, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, we're not just praying something that we're waiting a whole bunch of years Maybe it's just right there in your office. Maybe it's right there when you're making a cup of coffee. Maybe it's right there in your classroom at school, on your stool at your Starbucks. It's your kitchen table, at your job, whatever you do. Like, a door could open in your office. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it will, but it could, Right? It's right there, is what I'm saying. It's close. Right there when you're studying for that exam. So God is working in a reality that is no less real because we can't see it. And this heaven and this earth thing, they're not that, they're not this huge distance. Okay, I love that, but we gotta keep going. Second connection, in the New Jerusalem, there's this connection between past, present, and future. Now, Again, imagine the, the connection that the, that the early readers would have got from this by describing this city. Because if this was written after 70 AD, Jerusalem's in rubble. The Romans destroyed it. There's nothing left of Jerusalem. And for them to hear, wait, there's going to be a new one? And it's going to be Jahugus? That's Greek. Yeah. But there's this interesting connection. I could give you references from Psalms and Ezekiel, but just let me just give you a, a couple. They're here. Isn't it amazing that it's still called Jerusalem? Why not call it Jesusville? <laughs> Lamb City. Isn't that? It's New Jerusalem. I thought you were making all things new. And what's, what's on the gates? The 12 tribes. So you walk up and you see, oh, Reuben, Dan, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. (laughs) And we'll know who that is. And on the foundations, 12 apostles. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, Judah, son of James, number 12. (laughs) It's either Matthias that they drew lots for or the Apostle Paul. You guys arm wrestle over it. Um, (laughs) Isn't that incredible? It's a new Jerusalem, but it's got gates and foundations with really old names on it. And then you read verses like Hebrews 11, 8 and 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. So Abraham goes out to this place where he doesn't know where he's even going. He went to live in the land of promise in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Listen, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So somewhere in Abraham's heart, he knew that God was building something permanent. How did he know that? I don't know. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. You are no longer speaking to the church in Ephesus. You are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation, listen, of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. God, like, maybe this is what Jesus is working on. But God is not impressed with the new and the novel. So when he makes something new, it's also old. Which makes you wonder, maybe this is what God has been doing all along. All this time, he's been building a city. Let's lay down some tribes. Let's let's lay down some apostles. Let's put some walls and gates. Okay, we got a truck here. It's just new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. 
tribes, apostles. It's joining together of a foundation and gates and walls that God has been doing. So new doesn't mean excluding the old. So if you're trying to figure out how do I put something together, some sort of new faith or new something for myself, guess what? It's going to include something old. Because if you come up with a faith that has nothing old in it, be concerned. Be very, very concerned. Yeah. Okay. Real quick then. Who will Jesus be in the new Jerusalem? Um, Verse 22. Um, He will be the temple. I saw no temple in this city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. A place of worship replaced by the one to worship. I mean, if you can imagine in, in... in scripture previous to this, like if you went to the temple, you left your house, got on the road, traveled maybe for days, you showed up, there was a building, and a priest and sacrifice and all that, and you worshiped. Here, it's a person. The, the location is replaced by just the person. So his presence will permeate this city so that you won't have to really, how to put this, go anywhere to worship right? Like, worship will ever happen, like, wherever you are. So, if you're, like, out working in the garden, worship. Friends come over for a glass of tea, worship. (laughs) Right? It's just, he's that present, that he is the temple, okay? Secondly, Verse 23, the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamb, and by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never shut by day, and I love this line, and there will be no night. So its gates don't shut by day. So its gates are open all day, but guess what? There's no night. So they don't shut. (laughs) <laughs> so, but look, this, look at this line. The Lord, glory of God gives it light, but the lamp is the lamb. It's like all the light is funneled through Jesus, if you will. He's, he's radiating the glory of God. Isaiah 63, all the nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Zechariah 14, 7, it will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. Listen to this. Oh, this is beautiful. Isaiah 24, 23. The moon will be dismayed and the sun ashamed for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The sun will be ashamed Like the sun will be like, I got nothing. Look at that guy, how bright he is. Like, let me just back up a little here, right? New heavens, new earth. That just, you know, I can imagine the sun getting all upset and offended. Well, okay, I guess I'm not needed here anymore, right? Yeah, passive aggressive there, yeah. (laughs) Listen. Isaiah 60, violence shall no more be heard in the land. You shall call your walls salvation, your gates praise. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor brightness shall be the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light. Your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. So in other words... Sometimes you hate going to bed at night because the lights go out and you're just like alone with your thoughts. You've had a cruddy day, a cruddy week, a cruddy month, a cruddy decade, right? And it's just dark and you're just alone in that bed and it's just, the darkness just comes crashing in on you. Ugh. The guilt, the shame, the 
questions, the anger, whatever it is. And, he, and it says, the, the prophecy says, the Lord will be your everlasting light. Your days of mourning will be ended. So not only is he the light, but it's a picture of the fact that with light will come everlasting joy. We'll see this again next week. There's so much darkness in this world, so much darkness in this book, and it ends with light. But, but let me just, one more thing. Pearls so huge, you can make a gate out of them. I can only imagine how big that clam was. Woo! <laughs> Gold so plentiful, they use it for pavement. No wonder you can't take it with you, right? <laughs> Gold so pure, it's transparent. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to tell this real quick. I had some friends who were missionaries, and they had gotten older, and... Um, their parents had both passed away, and they were left to clean out this really big house. Their dad had been an executive with Coca-Cola. And um, they had, their parents had just never thrown anything away. It was a huge, huge house, just full of stuff. And they just had U-Hauls just taking stuff away. And um, one of them stopped me, and he said to me, Dean, all my life I've heard you can't take a U-Haul to heaven. But I never knew what it meant till just now. Today it hit me why you can't take you all to heaven. Jesus doesn't want any of this stuff either. <laughs> it's true. It's true. What's he going to do, right? Gold so plentiful, it's pavement. It's so pure, it's transparent. Precious stone after precious stone. I don't even know how to pronounce them all. But guess what? It's all just going to be reflecting this light in every different direction. Can you imagine the colors? I was talking to my friend at Starbucks this week, and we were talking about this very topic, and he just said to me, what if God creates new colors? And all the scientists said, you can't create new colors. We have a prism. They're all in there. Prism. The prism's got all the colors. Really? You want to put that on God? Because if you just thought that, he heard you, and he's going to make a new color, and he's going to go, look what I did, right? A new color. I was thinking this morning, I said, you know what it's going to do? Like, the Texas people think Tennessee orange is this nasty, pukey, bright orange, and the Tennessee people think Texas burnt orange is like the ugliest orange ever happened. God's going to make a new orange. And all the Texas and Tennessee people are going to come to here and go, that's a good orange. <laughs> and even the Sam Houston people will be there and go, yeah, I like that orange. <laughs> Unity of orange, all reflected from the glory of God, right? That's why all of the stones, I think, are there. And the last one, and this gets us to communion. Um, he's the temple, he's the light, and he's the lamb. He keeps, he keeps being called the lamb, just in this one little last paragraph. Um, the Lord God Almighty and the lamb, the lamb is its lamp, written in the lamb's book of life. He's the lamb, he's the lamb. Revelation 5, 6, I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain. Isn't this, he's still called the lamb, even after everything is new. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sin brought ruin. In the new Jerusalem... In the new heaven and the new earth, the Lamb will be the constant reminder that what sin ruined, Jesus redeemed by his blood. What sin ruined, his sacrifice will renew. And we'll never get to forget that. Nothing unclean will enter, nothing shameful or false. There won't be any need to lie because there won't be anything to be ashamed of. And we were the unclean people before the Lamb. Right? So again, like he's, it's a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, but it's the same Lamb. We had some Bible translators open over for dinner the other night. And I love talking about Bible translations. We were talking about this. And um, you guys have met David. He's been here. He said, he said, oh, Revelation 21, what do you picture when you picture a lamb? 
some of you who have spent time near that part of the world, right? He's like, you got to be careful how you translate it. If it's this big and fluffy, and you think that's what you're going to see when you look at the lamb, probably not. Probably more like the ram caught in the thicket when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, right? <laughs> a lamb. Nonetheless, the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. The constant reminder that was sin wrecked, Jesus redeems and restores and renews. And so, I don't know how long you've been at church. I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but you've been doing this same old thing for a long time, maybe. But guess what? It's a reminder of the body and blood of the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And as long as we do this, we do this in remembrance of Him. Right? And the day will come when He will be the light, the only light we'll need. He'll be the temple, the only temple we'll need. But He'll still be the one we call the Lamb.